Hello everyone, Lane Reidenauer here for our combined Sunday School classes at First Presbyterian Church here in Greensboro. As always, we're delighted to have you with us as we gather together virtually to worship God. It's been a rather exciting time around First Presbyterian Church over the last two weeks. Uh, in the last Saturday, a week ago, we celebrated our 196th birthday. That's correct. First Presbyterian Church had its organizational meeting on October 3rd, 1826, when the Reverend William Paisley gathered a group of people together and formed the committee that formed this church. It was the first church within the new corporate limits of the small borough of Greensboro. There was only about 25 families living here at that time. There was a church just to our north, Buffalo Presbyterian, and just to our east a few miles further was Alamance Presbyterian. But Greensboro's first corporate within the city limit church was First Presbyterian. Also in exciting news, last Sunday our congregation chose to welcome Dr. Jill Duffield as our new senior pastor here at First Presbyterian. She'll be the 12th senior pastor in our history and of course the first female. She'll be joining us in December and we're very, very excited to have her with us. Pres uh, Professor Sandy Gravitt will be along with just a few moments to continue her new series on Paul's letters to the Romans and she'll be with us shortly. Our hymn this morning is Make Me a Captive Lord, and the text is based in part on verses from Romans as well as several other books of the Bible. It isn't sung as often these days, but when I was growing up, I fell in love with this rich harmony in the accompaniment, and I later learned that the accompaniment was arranged by Arthur Sullivan of the musical team Gilbert and Sullivan, as he was also so well known for writing a good tune. As I've grown older, I've come to appreciate this rather unusual and complicated text that goes with it. Make Me a Captive Lord was written by the Reverend George Matheson in 1890. Reverend Matheson was a native of Glasgow, Scotland. He was in school, his vision started to fail, and by the time he was 18 years old, he'd lost his vision completely. But he went on to complete his degrees. He was a brilliant student at Glasgow University. He served faithfully as a minister in Glasgow and Edinburgh and wrote several books on theology as well as one volume of poetry and it was called Sacred Songs. According to the hymnologist William Reynolds, Reverend Matheson became widely known and greatly respected as one of the most outstanding Scottish Presbyterian ministers of his day. He was even invited by Queen Victoria to preach at Balmoral. A few hymns have come along in our lives that are, are, have such a capture of the paradoxical nature of faith, as well as, uh, as this hymn does, Make Me a Captive Lord. The text piles on these apparent contradictions in verse after verse that maybe only make sense to those of us of the Christian faith. Each verse contains several paradoxes, such as, Make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Uh, also, force me to render up my sword, and I will conqueror be. My will is not my own for, until thou hast made it mine. There are several of these throughout the hymn. Dr. C. Michael Hahn is a distinguished professor emeritus at Southern Methodist University, and he wrote the following phrase I think is really poignant. The language of paradox is perhaps the best way to explore the mystery of faith. We can't explain faith necessarily. The sanctifying grace of God is not the result of any merit of our own. We can, however, claim the reality of our faith in our lives as we live into the depth of the paradox. Now that might be a little bit obtuse for just a brief mention on a Sunday morning, but it's a very, very powerful thought. I'll put the words up on the screen and I invite you to sing along with me as we sing, Make Me a Captive, Lord. sink in life's alarm. 
comes when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. My heart is weak and poor until it master find. It has no spring of action sure, it varies with the wind. It cannot freely move, till thou hast wrought its chain. Enslave it with thy matchless love, and deathless it shall reign. My power is faint and low, till I have learned to serve. It wants the needed fire to glow, it wants the breeze to nerve. It cannot drive the world until itself be driven. Its flag can only be unfurled when thou shalt breathe from heaven. My will is not my own till thou hast made it thine. If it would reach a monarch's throne, it must its crown resign. It only stands unbent amid the clashing strife, when on thy bosom it has lent and found in thee. This is week two of our series on the book of Romans. If we want to understand the premise of Paul's epistle to the community at Rome, one topic immediately jumps off the page, righteousness. We are going to run across this word some 34 times just in one form alone. That doesn't count all of the variations we're going to see. But I want to focus today on a phrase that we're going to encounter right at the outset of the letter to the Romans. And that is in 117, the righteousness of God. Because if we're going to understand anything that Paul is saying in Romans, we have to get a hold of how Paul sees God and what Paul thinks God is all about. Now, Without a doubt, the idea of God's righteousness shows up in biblical material far beyond the book of Romans. And that fact makes it important for us to consider what righteousness means in a more comprehensive frame in order to help us pin down what Paul is saying about it and about God. It has to do with both who God is and what God is doing in relationship to humanity. If you're a student of theology, you might anticipate that I am going to take sides in a long-running debate about this issue. Some theologians and great Christian thinkers were certain that the righteousness of God makes reference to an attribute of the divine character something core to the nature of God. Others, like Martin Luther quite famously, saw the righteousness of God more as a gift that God bestows upon humanity. And those two sides rarely, if ever, met. I'm going to say from the outset that I cannot see a reason why it has to be an either or. Indeed, I am going to prefer and advocate for a both and approach. To get there, let's dig in from that point in chapter one, where we first encounter this phrase. 
While expressing his desire to come to Rome and evangelize there, Paul says in verse 16 of his opening, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for the power of God it is to salvation to everyone having faith. To the Jew first and to the Greek, the righteousness of God is in it revealed from faith to faith, as it has been written, and the righteous by faith shall live. The first thing we learn about the righteousness of God is that it is revealed. And the verb here is apocalypto. It's the same word from which we get apocalypsis. That is a revelation, an uncovering, something that is made apparent. We also get that this righteousness is linked to God's power, specifically to salvation. And it is related to faith, whether it be of the Jew or the non-Jew, here designated as Greek. While I'm going to be talking about righteousness first, you can clearly see here that we also need to be thinking about the term gospel as well, since it is, for Paul, where we see the righteousness of God made most apparent. To get it righteousness, however, I want us to begin in the Hebrew tradition, remembering that Paul is a Jew and looks to Jewish scripture and tradition, just as he does here when he quotes it at the very end, to understand who God is and what God has been doing. That is, where Paul looks for both attributes and actions of God. The Hebrew root Zadok the root term for righteousness suggests the idea of being hard, as in being resolute, as well as straight, this time as in reliable. I add these secondary ideas because you absolutely do not want to walk away with the idea in your head that righteousness is about being fixed or stubborn, unyielding, or unwilling to respond to the conditions at hand, because that would be to take us down a road that the texts themselves do not go. Let me give you a couple of examples to illustrate my point. Weights and measures are referred to by the word zedic, meaning just or right. Honest weight. Honest balances. Let me be weighed in a just balance all the same word, every one that I've got highlighted. The assumption here is not so much about correctness, but rather it's a precision that is just or fitting in terms of the kinds of exchanges we're making. I imagine a farmer's market situation. You don't go up to the merchant and say, calibrate those scales so we can get this weighed out to a certain number of decimal points. Rather, it is you expect something to be reliable, trustworthy, no thumb on the scale. There's no seeking to take advantage in righteousness. Rather, there is the idea that you can count on fairness, goodwill, and integrity. Paths to are Zedek, most famously, Psalm 23, God leads me in right paths for God's name's sake. It isn't that there is one way to go and everybody follows it. Rather, you might want to think of yourself as on a hike. I'm going to go to one of my favorite trails on the Blue Ridge Parkway where you come across a running stream that you can't leap across and you have to decide how to ford it. Typically, and especially after a good rain, you're going to want to proceed with caution because you don't want to lose your footing and be swept down a little bit or get soaking wet in the middle of your hike. You are constantly testing your balance to make sure a rock doesn't move or turn over unexpectedly. But your hiking partner, 
might not follow in your exact footsteps, nor do you always follow behind someone taking the lead. You see what I'm getting at? The path is thoughtful or considered more than circumscribed or rigid. I could keep going. We use Zedek with regard to offerings. That is done according to the appropriate protocols and for the correct reasons. We could talk about Zedek in terms of the way that leaders should behave and the kinds of judgment that they should demonstrate. We could talk about Zedek in its moral and ethical dimensions. Look at this with the God judging righteously who explores the heart and the mind. And of course, that heart and mind done rightly would emphasize acting on the basis of justice because here we have the description of a city that was once full of justice and righteousness was lodged in that city. But now look at what happens. There's murder. There's all of this corruption. And you will see they do not defend the orphan and the widow's cause does not come before them. What do we make of all this? Well, in all of these components, in the examples that I'm showing you, there is built in the idea that there's a standard of behavior that exists in a given role. And God is, in most of these cases, both an exemplar of that standard of righteousness and one who expects people to uphold it. But I want to underscore that the concept of righteousness here is not rigid or fixed. Every circumstance is unique, and thus the way in which righteousness is lived out doesn't conform to a checklist kind of approach. Rather, it's a disposition that moves you towards reflection and consideration and an ability to discern what needs to be done in a given circumstance. But you have to remember too that Paul is not speaking exclusively in the book of Romans to an audience of Jews. He is speaking in Greek to an audience that is also Gentile and they would be educated not only in Greek ideas and philosophy but they would be immersed in the daily life of the Roman Empire as lived out in its capital. We have to understand then that they might hear the word righteousness differently. And Paul would recognize that even though his idea of righteousness is contextually situated within the Hebrew scriptures and traditions, that that concept doesn't translate readily. For his audience, diakusune would be an abstract concept as opposed to the more specific kinds of behavioral things that the Hebrew language is calling to mind. To understand at least one difference in the audience's perception if they were Gentiles living in Rome, we could go to a guy like Valerius Maximus. He was a writer in Rome at the time of Paul, and in his Facta et Dicta, he says of the Roman Empire, Among all nations, our society is the outstanding and clearest example of righteousness. Many Romans were taught to believe exactly what Valerius Maximus is saying here. When they fought, for example, the cause was always just. Even when they took over a people, they believed that being part of the Roman Empire granted them a better life than they once had. Now for certain, this idea of the Romans as the embodiment of all things good and right had its critics. But just the use of the term in Paul's writings would be perking up their ears to these kinds of connections. They might be wondering how Paul is speaking about a gospel revealing the righteousness of God 
when that attribute is something that they most clearly understood as expressed in the conduct of a nation and its leaders and their decision making. How would they hear Paul? Here's where it starts to get fun. If you look carefully at the entirety of the letter to the Romans, it is a letter about God's story. There is a story about the created order happening. There is a story about the Jews. And there is a story about all humanity. And for Paul, all of these stories are interwoven. These stories are focused on our, meaning the human, tight corner of this vast universe and what we can know about how it came to be, how it exists in relationship to and expresses its creator, and how that same creator has been reaching out across all time to various peoples, asking them to be in a life-giving and fulfilling relationship, a relationship effective in their here and now, and a relationship that also touches the eternal beyond what limited mortal human beings can know or expect to experience. That story is all gospel. It is all good news. Let's start with the story that Paul says is to all humanity, because that's where he starts. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 20, Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. We talked about this idea over the summer in our study of Proverbs as part of wisdom literature. The creation itself, Paul is saying, speaks God. And in doing so, that order, whether or not you are part of a community that God is in specific relationship to, that order is making some demands on you. Our Catholic friends call this idea natural law. And the idea of natural law can be summed up in three basic things. First of all, there are some universal and immutable moral truths. Secondly, human beings have the capacity to know these moral truths. And thirdly, human nature is the basis on which these moral truths are known. They are, in other words, self-evident. But Paul sees much of humanity as resistant to seeing God and this order. It's broken. Look at him in verse 28 and following. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They're really not good. Paul is saying, in spite of the fact that God has made God's self apparent to them, they have chosen to go another way. Even if it's chaotic, even if it's unjust, they continue to behave in these manners. And Paul goes on to say they even applauded or cheered on others to do exactly the same. This is Paul's take on the broader story, the non-Jewish human experience. Well, the Jews, they have the law, a direct guide from God, but they're not doing much better. This is Romans 2.17 and following. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast about your relation to God, then you also have an obligation to be faithful. But it says, you then that teach others, won't you teach yourselves? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? 
You that forbid adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you rob temples? You that boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul saying for the Jews, knowing what they ought to be doing according to this covenant that God has made with them and actually living it out. Well, these things are at odds. It's important for us to recognize that what Paul is doing here by showing us how the Gentiles should have known better but have failed, the Jews should have known better but have failed, is leveling the playing field. Nobody has a leg to stand on, so to speak, before God. In this situation, one would anticipate God destroying, punishing, wiping out. But Paul says God does not do that. Instead, what Paul is going to argue is that God reveals a certain kind of reliability, a resoluteness, a thoughtfulness about what should be the solution, a considered action, a deeper justice. Paul says God demonstrates righteousness. And in doing so, Paul takes it a step further and says it is something that we have already been seeing God doing again and again and again. Take a look, for instance, at Romans 3. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed. But that righteousness is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That is for Paul. This righteousness of God has been continually on display, but now it's on display in a new and more powerful way through Jesus Christ. When we think about the idea of God's righteousness that Paul's trying to get across, the great writer and thinker Abraham Joshua Heschel helps me. He says, righteousness goes beyond justice. Justice is strict and exact, giving each person their due. Righteousness implies benevolence, kindness, generosity. This helps me get Paul because for Paul, salvation makes no sense apart from a righteous God. Acting as one who has faith in response makes no sense apart from a righteous God. The gospel, the story of God, makes no sense for Paul apart from a righteous God. If there is not a righteous God, in other words, there is no salvation, there is no faith, and there is no gospel because the very act of all of these things has to be premised on a God who is behaving with benevolence, with kindness, with generosity toward not only the Jew, but also towards the Gentile and as theologian Jürgen Moltmann reminds us, it's not just about humanity. He says it is modern narrow-mindedness to relate the church only to the world of human beings. And he goes on to remind us that if we are the beginning and the germ of the new creation, we have to think about the creation itself and not just our own personal salvation. We have to be a part of the whole. Where do we leave it? This idea of a righteous God, I would argue, 
should beckon us. Who among us does not long for a God who's benevolent and kind and generous? An eternal God of life who sees us in our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities and our mortality, but sees us through eyes of compassion and care. And when that benevolence, that kindness, that compassion, that care, that generosity, that righteousness takes root in us, indeed it gives us, Paul is going to argue, the ability to be the children of a righteous God, the children who make manifest these qualities in our relationships with one another, children who are bringing the kingdom of God into the present reality, children who are participating in creation, finding its wholeness, children who are getting along, Jew and Greek, children for whom the revelation of God, the gospel of God, is made real. It is all built on the idea of coming to know a righteous God. That is something to celebrate in any time. And I hope for you a premise that will guide your thinking about what Paul says God is doing in this letter to the Romans.